Hello and welcome to Resilience, the global adaptation podcast, the show where we'll be exploring the best solutions and cutting edge technologies for adapting to climate change. From floating cities to flood resilient farms to forest seawalls, we're coming to you from the UN's Global Adaptation Network. I'm Liz Mullen Bernhardt. And I'm Marcus Neild. In our podcast, we'll be talking to the most renowned adaptation experts, but we'll also be traveling around the world, virtually of course, to meet people and communities on the front lines to learn about how they've built resilience on the ground. We're really excited to share some amazing climate success stories with you. Thanks for being here as we adapt to climate change one conversation at a time. This episode, we're talking cities. Marcus, I'm from Chicago, you're from London. In fact, 55% of the world's population lives in cities. And many city dwellers are already experiencing a new climate reality. 70% of cities are being impacted right now by the world's rising temperatures and all the difficulties that that brings. Water shortages, heat waves, flooding. Thankfully, there's already a lot of urban adaptation that's happening. Now, Marcus, what would your perfect climate resilient city look like? Hmm, good question. I guess it would need to harvest its own rainwater, right, to be resilient to drought. Then I suppose the buildings would be designed with climate resilience in mind. So in hot places, homes can be constructed to face the prevailing wind to catch a cooling breeze. What about you, Liz? What's your true climate resilient city? Well, I'm a water person at heart. I grew up near the water in the Great Lakes region of the U.S., And I was recently in Brittany, France, in the city of Rennes, where my sister lives, and I was really amazed at all the beautiful landscaping they've done around floodable spaces and parks near all their waterways. Lots of bike paths, places to hang out, and biodiversity hotspots. That's my kind of adaptation. Nice. My family are also deep in adaptation at the moment. We're building a house in London next to the River Thames, and the house will be 1.5 metres high on top of stilts to avoid flooding really reminds me about how adaptation operates at the individual or household level as well. That is super cool. Can't wait to see you in that house, Marcus. So one of our guests today is Kobe Brandt. She's the Africa Regional Director and the Deputy Secretary General of ICLE, which is a global cities network. Welcome so much to Resilience, the Global Adaptation Podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be with you today on behalf of ICLE and also in my personal capacity, because this is a topic I feel very passionate about. That's great. And what what is ICLE? ICLE is, I'm very proud to say, the oldest and largest uh, local and subnational government network created by cities initially, for cities, some 30 plus years ago, because cities at that stage realized that they needed a platform where they could connect to each other and learn from each other and leap boundaries together. We have a very, very strong resilience and adaptation center in our African office. Um, Adaptation is is very much key to a lot of the work that we do here in Africa. Our bread and butter is implementing projects on the ground with local communities, with local leaders. If you recognise Kobe's voice, well, that's because she featured in our previous episode about how we recover from the COVID-19 pandemic and build climate resilience. If you didn't hear it, do check it out. Now, as Kobe said, adaptation is key to a lot of ICLE's work in Africa. So I began our conversation by asking her to share a couple of great examples of urban adaptation successes, including one in Malawi. It's an adaptation program around climate resilience, around rivers and the river that runs through the long way. We worked with the community and we listened to their needs and we had to clean up the ecosystem and to keep the river from clogging up and flowing freely again uh, to secure water downstream and also in the long way. But one of the spin-offs was that there was a lot of waste material and a lot of waste actually then got recycled and we actually started it's up a composting program and a composting initiative that is still running and run by women in a profitable way, providing livelihoods to these communities in ways that we couldn't have foreseen when we embarked on the project. Another example I maybe just mentioned is that um, 
we are able to use wonderful, innovative new technology as well. For instance, the Minecraft tool or game was employed by us and UN Habitat in an intervention we did in Addis Ababa to redesign a specific area, common open space, uh, for mixed use and recreational purposes, bringing nature, people, activities, safe outdoor facilities, etc. available. And we did it through the Minecraft tool and that I find really so inspiring these um, whole of community and whole of society approaches that are available to us through new technologies. My kids would be super excited yeah they would love to take part in that I'm sure. Well, it was great fun, you know, because most of the people that work in our office are very dynamic, young, entrepreneurial type of scientists, very smart people, and they embrace this new technology, you know. Don't for one moment think that Africa is behind when it comes to technology. I mean, everybody's best friend is their smartphone, you know, and with a smartphone, you can do things like you can become a citizen scientist and you can actually do a lot of observations and feed it into a central point. We see that happening in Dar es Salaam with the World Bank, for instance, where a lot of Dar es Salaam is informally developed, like many big cities in Africa. And there again, they're using citizen science through something as simple as a mobile phone, where people collect data about their neighborhoods and feed it into a system. And in that way, you actually get a sense of the landscape, who lives there, really helps with planning. And also, of course, you know, adaptation. So Kobe, how can cities make us safer from the impacts of climate change? Imagine those little fish that swim together in those beautiful patterns. You see the same with birds, the same with herds of animals. You see it in trees. I mean, trees feed each other. They talk to each other. They are connected in our forests. So we are also part of nature. Human beings want to be together. So firstly, you do feel safer when you are together, but it may be a perceived safeness. So in order for a city to really be safer, you need to be on top of data. You need to know who lives the way, who are the most vulnerable, who are in the lowlands, where you should be developing and where you should not be developing. How do you treat those people to perhaps make them more resilient where they are living or convince them to maybe move up to higher ground, etc. And then there needs to be a lot more emphasis on risk preparedness and disaster management in a very precautionary way. Expect and plan for the worst and hope and pray for the best. But, you know, in, in that whole equation, we're going to see more floods. We're going to see more droughts. We're going to see more storm events. We know that is the way that that the world is going to go before things get better. And let's all hope things get better sooner rather than later. But for the next few decades, we need to be prepared for those unforeseen and unexpected turns of events and very sudden turns of events in weather unpredictability. And therefore, the best way to provide a safer city is to have data and to have to connectivity with your communities so that your communities know very clearly what happens when a storm is on its way? Where do I go to? How do I prepare for it? Um, I think, you know, in the Americas, um, people are very well aware. They have the emergency packs ready and they can get in a car and they probably have spare gas and they can get out. And, and we even see in the most developed uh, situations in the world, even there, some people do get stuck, unfortunately, and they do live through terrible weather events. But can you imagine in a city where people do not have newspapers, where they do not have access to television and, and information? That is where you need feet on the ground. You need community leaders to work very closely with your city leaders. And let's make no mistake about it. Any big weather event or any big a catastrophe at city level. It's the mayor's office or the governor's office. It's the local leaders that are the first responders that need to step up and actually come and support these communities in a very hands-on way. We see sometimes mayors handing out those bottles of water. When the taps run dry, it's the mayor's door 
that gets knocked on. Whether it's their function or their legal mandate or not, they are the first responders. They need to be brave. They need to be prepared. But they can only be so if they have the right data at the local level to understand what they are dealing with. I want to tell you one more thing, just out of interest, because I'm thinking of it now. Um, in a city like Lagos, one of our biggest cities in the African continent, millions of people live there. And imagine the work of the water engineers there. They've got to ensure that there's enough potable water coming in and also wastewater flowing out of the systems. But there is a tradition, like in many African cities, that over weekends, a very large part of the population, as much as a third of the population, moves back into the countryside to go and spend the weekend with their family. So imagine your water system. Is it geared for these sudden surges up and down of water usage? No, it's not. So traditional infrastructure is not geared for the reality of life in the modern city and in the really fast growing city. Um, so especially when it comes to infrastructure, I think a lot more attention needs to go into building resilient infrastructure. And often that means with nature-based solutions and not necessarily high-tech solutions. Um, nature-based solutions may take a little bit longer or it may be a little bit out of the box and unusual to your typical engineer in a city, but that is certainly the smarter way to go because it's more sustainable, more resilient, and in the end, much more friendly to the environment and cost effective as well. It's great to hear you talk about climate resilient infrastructure there, Kobe, because uh, at the UN Environment Programme earlier this year, we released a practical guide to climate resilient buildings and communities. And it was a really interesting publication because it shows you in a really hands on way what you can do to your homes, buildings, banks, post offices, town halls to make them resilient. Um, so, yeah, people, I think sometimes oversee the importance of that and, and exactly how many trillions of dollars we can save through those solutions. What's nice about that publication is that it gives very practical examples uh, for people working and managing our cities. You know, the people in, in local administrations are not necessarily climate experts. Many of our local governments across Africa do not even have climate departments. Um, the term climate change is something that people are still getting their heads around, you know. They may call it other things and they may understand what's happening, but dealing with it may sometimes feel very overwhelming for a local administration, especially if you're looking at your fast-growing cities that, that do not have all the resources that your mega cities have. Um, and even your mega cities are struggling with this, you know. So the more tangible and practical solutions we can have and present in bite-sized ways to our cities, that they can adapt, digest, and see if it works for them and try it out. You know, that's certainly something we need, need to do much more of. And I think cities are very hungry for it. We saw during COVID-19, we started an online, we had to reinvent a lot of things that we do and the way we do it, you know, to keep on delivering our projects and our services to our cities. And we went online and we didn't know in Africa how connected the African continent and how receptive the African continent would be for this online work or modality of, of, of getting knowledge across. But we were overwhelmed. It's so popular that we've actually now launched Learn with ICLEI, an online academy of courses, larger, longer-term courses, but also small two-hour webinars, etc. And cities are tuning in all the time, and they are connecting and so active in that platform because there's such a need for them just to see how other cities are dealing with, whether it's a storm surge or a, a sudden flood or a drought or, or heat island effects, what, whatever the challenge may be, they can learn there from each other. And we have been astounded by the interest and the participation in Learn with ICLEI. So, Kobe, what do you think is the single biggest topic in adaptation right now that no one is talking about? So the single biggest topic, people are talking about it, but they're not getting it right is finance, adaptation finance. There cannot be a bigger topic than that right now. Um, we need to note that the annual adaptation costs in developing countries are estimated 
at 70 billion US dollars right now, and that this figure is expected to reach 280 to 500 billion US dollars in 2050. You know, it's not too far away. Multilateral support for adaptation in 2017 was only 14.6% of the overall multilateral development finance. So this tells a story. This tells us a story that, yes, that is the single biggest thing to address. In ICLE Africa, we have been developing a number of tools and accessibility in terms of understanding how to build a bank adaptation project it's much easier to build a bankable mitigation project and even that is very hard for most cities around the world still but to build a case that you will get a DFI or a development bank or an investor to invest in when it comes to adaptation is extremely hard because your returns are long term and that storm may never come <laughs> and that flood may actually pass your city and all your infrastructure spent on it may not be used or needed for a decade or two. We need to really get a different mindset across the world from all players when it comes to being open to putting money on the table for adaptation, because that is critical. Kobe, that's great. How can our audience find out more about the wonderful work that you're doing? The simplest way is just to Google ICLEI, I-C-L-E-I, or you can also look at some of our innovative nature-based solutions work by accessing our Cities with Nature and Regions with Nature initiatives that are global and that are much bigger than ICLEI. So um, I would really ask you to look us up on Instagram, Twitter, but also through our website and get engaged in Learn with ICLEI Africa and become part of the movement towards a more sustainable urban world. Thank you so much for your time, Kobe. Thanks so much, Kobe, for joining us. It was a pleasure speaking with you and keep up the great work. Well, you guys too. And thank you so much. Such incredibly infectious optimism from Kobe Brand and wonderful innovation from her ICLEI team. That's I-C-L-E-I. It's so great. So let's move from beautiful Cape Town to another city with a dramatic backdrop like Table Mountain, it's actually also a volcano. And that is the capital of El Salvador. San Salvador is trying to follow the lead of cities like Berlin and Wuhan to become a sponge city. And residents in sponge cities use a variety of green engineering techniques, like planting trees, to reduce flooding and cool down the city. And I've been speaking to someone who has a crucial role to play because of where he lives. Hello to everyone, my name is Hector Velasquez. I'm a coffee producer from El Salvador in Central America. And I've been doing this for the past 14, 15 years, getting accustomed to the climate change, which we are all suffering. I am the highest farm in the volcano of San Salvador. We're overlooking the city. Because of that, if there is a landslide, we're bound to have a disaster downstream. Let me give you an example. Like two years ago, we had a tropical storm, which flooded a lot of industrial areas as well. So we lost production capacity. To help the community adapt to climate change, I understand that there has been some support from UNEP, the United Nations Environment Programme, and the Global Environment Facility, uh, and that this has been through a project known as City Adapt. Could you tell us a little bit about this project and, and what it's trying to achieve? This is a great project. I mean, it's something that that we need and a lot of people to pay attention to. This project has helped empower people to see what they can do to prevent or to minimize the impact of climate change and also to help the city adapt, as the name of the project suggests, to climate change. And most of the work has been done in the volcano of San Salvador, which is the area that impacts the most with the runoff of the volcano to the city. So the more preventive work that we could do at a higher altitude minimizes the risk downstream in the city. There have been programs to create ditches to absorb water. That way you decrease the speed of the runoff water and you help infiltration of the water instead of creating damage downstream. 
We've done a lot of very low tech, high impact actions that are available to pretty much everyone. There's no need for extra materials. Pretty much everything is within the reach of every farmer. So if you do a, a stone wall, you do it with the stones that are available in your field. If you do a tree trunk wall, you use the trees that fell on your farm. If you do a live barrier, you use plants that are accessible within your field. The program is, is effective because there's not a lot of cost to it. It's a lot of uh, willingness from the farmers and the community to see that what they do is for their own benefit. And of course, for the people down in the city as well. We've received economic assistance, but I think the most important part of it has been making us conscious of, of what we do and the impact of what we do, what it has in the impact of people downstream. And I understand that the city is again turning to reforestation, again turning to, to, to trees to, to defend against these floods. How does bringing trees into your city tackle flooding? It's a, it's a very delicate situation. In paper, it looks very, very good. In reality, there's a, a lack of a city planning. But this goes a long, long, long way before. And, and the problem is that you cannot demolish like whole neighborhoods. So you drive through San Salvador and you go to the most busy streets and you're hardly going to find a tree. When you go to the side streets, then you're going to see a lot of trees, which are beautiful. But the way that trees actually do work is they regulate the temperature because of the shade that they provide. Temperature tends to lower depending on tree species by many degrees. Then you have the root system that actually helps protect the soil. It binds the soil. And then there's how they help in stopping erosion. Erosion by rain is a mechanical effect. The soil has like a, a maximum absorption capacity. So when you have too much water in a the soil, then it liquefies. When it liquefies, then you have a landslide. That's more difficult when you have roots. That helps bind the soil. And at the same time, when the leaves fall, they prevent the drops from causing soil erosion and they help absorb water. The city has done a lot of work in reforestation in the basins of the different creeks that cross the city. The problem is that a lot of sections of these creeks have been come impermeable. Because of paving the floor and tarmac and, and urban development, right? Correct. So the amount of absorption of water it's very little. The, the creeks only work as a, a means of transport of water. And water needs to go somewhere. There isn't a, a lot of planning regarding as ways to stop the speed of water, to create absorption ponds. There isn't one artificial pond around all of the city. And so this is a solution that you'd like to see a lot more? Yes, I think it has very many good impact. It's pleasant to the eye, it's pleasant to the environment. Ponds tend to be like, they tend to moderate the microclimate of the areas where they are. They help you keep water a resource that is, is becoming and will become more scarce through time. So a way of harvesting water would be great for people to take advantage during the dry seasons. In our case, in the volcano, you know, volcanoes are like sponges. We have no rivers in the volcano. All of the offsprings are at the base of the volcano. So the more water that we can harvest to stop as a runoff means directly that we're going to have more water in the offsprings. So more water is going to be clean, more water is going to be available. So when you think about climate change and you think about your children, do you, do you have hope for them and, and their future? Yes, I'm actually working for them and trying to do something so they could have less risk than what I have. I think teaching them that, that we have to work with nature and not against it, I think is very important. They like to see little animals in the farm. I mean, there's no hunting. I try to show them how everything works together. All animals that live within the farm, all the insects, everything helps us and we need to work with them. That's beautiful. Uh, it sounds like your kids are going to grow up to be adaptation and coffee experts <laughs> by the sounds of it. Hopefully, hopefully. I have one that tells me that it, it, it doesn't like the agricultural side. He's going to move to London and sell the coffee. How about that? <laughs>
Cool. Hector, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm very glad to have this opportunity to make people conscious of, of the impact of their actions everywhere. I mean, we live in this bubble that's called Earth and we're all in it. So what you do over there impacts over here. Now, as Hector has pointed out, past urban planning mistakes have wreaked a lot of climate havoc. But there is a lot of city adaptation going on all over the world. And you can find out more through the links we've shared in the show notes. Thanks for listening. There are more adaptation success stories in our other episodes, so please do listen to those, subscribe and share. We're Liz Mullen Bernhardt and Marcus Neild, and you can find out more about our organisation, the UN Global Adaptation Network, in the show notes. This has been Resilience. Keep adapting. Penny Dale is the producer. 